In this episode of the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop, see how Gerald transforms a Lebanese cedar log and curly cherry lumber into a family heirloom. The Appalachian Heritage Woodshop is brought to you by Christian Internet Services, common sense internet marketing and web design. Our internet marketing commissions are based on results. Robinson and Mackle, thinking business, practicing law. Waterlock's unique tongue oil and resin blend stains, sealers, and finishes. The go-to finish for wood enthusiasts since 1910. The Appalachian area is comprised of 13 eastern states covering 205,000 square miles of rugged, mountainous terrain. It stretches from New York to Mississippi, with West Virginia being the only state totally encased in the area. When this region was first settled, the immigrants had to travel over the Appalachian mountain range with only what they could carry or haul by wagons. They would make furniture and other wooden items that were necessary and functional. The blanket chest served multiple purposes in early Appalachia. Not only were they used to store blankets and linen safely away from pests, they also served as additional seating. Blanket chests are also known as hope or dowry chests. I'm here in my shop in Cabell County, West Virginia, and I have a guest, Lee Lewis. Lee, thanks for coming by my shop today. Thank you for having me today. And the reason I asked you to come by I built a blanket chest just for you, and I want the viewers to see this chest, and I was specifically wanted to talk about some of the material used in the chest. Now, the, the cherry I had, but the Lebanese cedar you supplied. Can you tell me a little bit about the tree that uh, this Lebanese cedar came from? The, uh, quite some time ago, I guess let's start back. I'm 45 years old now. When I was probably eight to 10 years old, my grandfather, who is of Lebanese descent, mm -hmm. and on the flag is the Lebanese cedar, which is famous for being grown in, in, in natural in, in Lebanon. And, and the flag is a field of white. It's, it's just the, just the it's flag. It's red up top, red up bottom, on the bottom, and the middle is white with the Lebanese cedar. Right, the Lebanese beautiful cedar, flag. Yeah, the Lebanese cedar is a very, it's a biblical tree, which is referenced in the Bible. Yeah. Or Several references, yes. Five or six different times. Um, at any rate, back uh, when I was probably 10 years old or so, a friend of his tra traveled to Lebanon, came back, and brought him a tree. A seedling. A seedling. It was wow. this tall, and it was wrapped in um, a wet paper towel, made the journey over, and it was in a, in a baggie. Um, we took that tree, and we planted it, him and I together, where did you plant? We planted it at his house in Canal City in Charleston, okay. West Virginia. Okay. I was living there at the time. I was raised in my grandparents' sure. house. I was extremely close to my grandfather. That's good. And we planted this tree together, and um, we put it somewhat close to a, uh, a fence because we were worried run over with a lawnmower yeah. or somebody kick yeah. it over. Uh, so that might have been, I guess, could have been 1983 or so. So anyway. you, you actually observed this tree as it grew watched, from seedling up to mature. Watched it all the way grow up and always took great pride in watching it grow. Watched its beauty as it grew. A cedar tree will grow yeah. tall. This thing got, I wish I knew the exact height at its, at its tallest maturity. Mm -hmm. I want to say every bit of 40 feet. Wow. It was a gorgeous tree. There was a gentleman that lived behind us. He does a, a lot of uh, landscaping for people. Sure. And... I was talking to him one day. I was like, do you see that tree there? He goes, I know exactly who that tree is. He goes, there's maybe two in the state that I know of. Lee. Wow. And that's the most beautiful one out of the ones that I've seen. I did take it to the mill, had it milled the way I wanted it milled. Uh, then I air dried it, uh, and it took uh, a little bit over a year, mm -hmm. and then kiln dried it. And then we sat down and discussed what we wanted to build out of it, and we both agreed a blanket chest would be a good... Uh, historical piece that would uh, be an heirloom for your family of course with uh, with a very personal touch yeah exactly that's what it is yeah it's, it's beautiful uh, I appreciate that 
Uh, well, I hope your family enjoys this as much as I enjoy building it. So let's go back to the wood shop and I'll show you how I built this blanket chest using cherry and Lebanese cedar. It doesn't matter if you're using hand tools or machinery in your shop. You need to know the safe way to operate your equipment. Make certain you have the proper safety equipment and most importantly, use your PPE. Be safe and enjoy your shop time. We're back in the Appalachian Heritage Wood Shop. You just saw how a blanket chest would have been used in the Appalachian area. So I'm going to show you how to build one. I have some Lebanese cedar that the client provided. His grandfather planted the tree. It perished due to insect damage. So we harvested it and dried it. And I'll be using this for the raised panels. And I have some curly cherry here, which I'll be using for the styles and rails. Okay, now I'm ready to make the raised panel out of the Lebanese cedar. And now you can see the big advantage of keeping the board sequentially as I came off of the mill. This is number three and number four from the log. And when I open it up, just like a book, it is book matched and you can see the grain matches. So now what I need to do is strike a straight line right down through here. Following the grain, and what I'll do is cut this on the bandsaw and then come over and cut the match over here and then it'll be ready to glue together as a, as a book matched panel. Okay, I take the scrap that was cut off of the previous piece. And if I lay it down here, it'll match up perfect. And when I get it matched up, then I can just put a mark right there. And go with a straight line on that and that way the grain will be aligned with the previous board that I just cut. Okay now I'm ready to cut my line at the bandsaw. Now I've run the edge through the joiner to give me a perfectly straight edge. So now I'm going to rip it to the right width. Okay, now I need to face joint these boards before I glue them up. Okay, now I need to run these through the planer. Now that I've got the panels cut to the right size and sanding them, now I'm ready to profile and make them a raised panel. And the best machine for that is a shaper. If you've noticed, I like having the cutter bit below the table instead of above the table. And although I have a feeder, I'm going to do these by hand because there's only a few of them. Cross cut the boards here at the miter station. First thing I need to do is face joint the cherry. 
and the joiner is the best tool for that. So now I'm ready to run these through the planer and plane them to the right thickness. The blanket chest is frame and panel construction and this time I'm going to do what's called a stub mortise and tenon. Normally when you do a mortise and tenon joint you pick the best face of the board and that will be your reference face and all the measurements are from that face. So if there's any discrepancy in the joinery it'll be on the back side which is the side you don't see. So the prominent side will match up perfectly. For this application I'm going to reference the center of the board instead of a face. Now the way I do that is here at the table saw. I've got the dado blade on the table saw. The two blades are on the arbor and there's no chippers so that's about a quarter of an inch wide. So the fence is set up so that this blade is slightly off center from the thickness of this board. So what I'll do is I'll put one face against the board, run it through, turn it around and the other face will go against the fence and run it through and that'll perfectly center up my groove which is also my mortise. So let's see how that works. Now you can see a perfectly centered groove, which is also the mortise for the stub tenon. Historically, the corners of the blanket chest would have been nailed together or they would have had uh, a common joint like a rabbit joint. For this blanket chest, I'm going to do what's called a locking rabbit joint. So basically, I've got the dado blade set up with a 1 8 inch chipper, so it should cut a groove 3 8 of an inch wide. And I've got it set 3 8 of an inch from the fence. And the depth is, I believe, 3 8 Yes, 3 8 So now I'm going to cut a groove in the back of the front and the back styles. I like using a French curve to lay out the nice sweeping curve along the bottom rail on the front and back of the chest and the sides also. So now I need to take this rail off and take it over to the bandsaw and cut the curve. Okay, I just finished cutting the contour on the bandsaw. Now I'm ready to sand this and the oscillating spindle sander is a perfect tool for that. I'm ready to glue up the front which is identical to the back. It's very similar to the side except it has two panels instead of one. So that means there is a center style. So when I glue it together, I have to account for that. And it just has to take a little bit more time to get everything lined up. And again, I don't want any glue squeeze out on the panel because it needs to float. Okay, now I'm ready to glue up a side panel. I've already uh, put it together and dry clamped it, make sure everything fits right and everything is good. So now I'm going to take it apart and I'm going to glue it back together. 
Now when you do this, you need to pay attention because there is an inside and an outside to the panel. And there is an inside and outside to the styles. Okay, so I want to put glue on the stub tenon. And I do not want the glue to spread down to the panel because the panel needs to float. So I got to be careful and not put too much on. So that's why I'm using a brush. I also like to put a pencil mark exactly where these go so I can line them up quick so they're square. I like to take a little bit of wax and go right around the corner. And as you can see, I've rounded over the corners. So if I have any glue squeeze out, it's not a problem. Now before I clamp these, I like to take my finger and align the top. It's easier to get them aligned by feel than it is by measuring. Once I get that aligned, then I go ahead and clamp it. Now you can see what the chest looks like. I've got it glued and clamped together. The locking rabbit joints on the corner make it easy to align and square. So now I'll let this set overnight and then work on the top and bottom. Okay, I've removed the clamps from the glue up. I've sanded it and rounded over the edges, and now I'm ready to install the bottom. Let me show you how I do that. The panels are glued up and in their clamps, and while they're drying, I'm gonna focus on the bottom. I've taken some leftover material and uh, face jointed it and ripped it, and now I'm gonna run it through the planer. Okay, I just got finished running the boards through the planer to get the proper thickness for the bottom. Now what I'm going to do is create a tongue and groove joint, which will lock the bottom in place. And I like using a dado blade since I have a table saw dedicated to that. So what I've done is put in two blades, which is a quarter inch in width, set up my fence. And again, I'll run it through, turn it around and run it through again. And that'll perfectly center up the groove. And now I've installed a sacrificial fence, put a couple extra chippers in so the dado blade is buried into the sacrificial fence. And now I've adjusted the height and now what I'm going to do is cut a tongue on the other side of the board from the groove. Now that all the bottom pieces are tongue and grooved, now I need to cut them to the proper length. And the first thing I need to do is create a square edge. Now that I've got one end square, I've got a stop set up at the right distance. So I put the square edge over next to the stop. And that way I can cut them all to the right length. Okay, I've laid the chest on its side. I put a couple spacer sticks in here and clamped them in place so the bottom ledger will line up. Now I'm going to put a little bit of glue on this and I'll spread that around. And then I'm going to use a nail gun to secure it. And the reason I do that, glue is a lubricant before it is an adhesive. So most of you know this is going to slide around when I put the clamps on it and the nails will keep it from sliding. And of course the clamps will apply the pressure. I've made several of these that are tongue and grooves. 
The first one is square cut. These just fit right into the bottom. And I'm not going to glue these in place until after I do the finish to allow just enough for it to expand and contract. There you can see what the bottom looks like. Okay, now I'm ready to install the hinge. And the way I like to do it, I like to fold the hinge back, put it on the edge, and that references how far in to set it. And I'll line the barrel up with the end of the style. And then it's just a matter of marking it around the hinge. And then I will take a knife and score it. I've clamped the board onto the blanket chest and this will give me more surface for the bottom of the router to run on. So it'll be more stable. And before I do that, I'm going to take a, a chisel and the little scratch mark that was made with the knife, I pull the chisel back until I feel it drop in that little line. And then just tap it a little bit so it makes the line a little bit more prominent. Now I've got the router set up for the proper depth and it's a spiral bit. So now I'm going to freehand route out where the hinge goes. Now it's just a matter of cleaning back to the line with the chisel. And there the hinge fits in there. Some of you have noticed that the depth is a little bit more than normal. When I am installing a lid that overhangs the back like this chest lid does, then I will mortise into the chest twice the depth of a leaf. And that allows the lid to set flush and open and allows the back of the lid to act as a stop so the lid will only open about 90, 95 degrees. I like to disassemble it and finish the parts. So I'm going to start with the lid. I've got it turned upside down. I have mixed up some uh, varnish and oil, get a nice blend here. And I like to put it on with a rag. And what, what you want to do is flood the surface and keep the surface wet and it will absorb in some areas faster than it will others and that's why you have to keep it wet and where this is a floating panel I need to make sure I get back into the edge real good it really brings out the the collar of the cherry and it really accentuates the grain it's an easy finish it, it really looks good but it does not provide a lot of protection. But the good thing about it is if something happens, you can just sand it and put more finish right over top of it. Now that I've covered the whole lid, I need to let it set for about 10 to 15 minutes, making sure if there's any areas where it's soaked in, I go back and get those. And then what I need to do is wipe off the excess in about 10 or 15 minutes. So while that's setting, I'm going to uh, go ahead and put a finish on the chest. Now I'm going to apply the same finish on the chest. I like to start with it upside down. And again, it's just a matter of flooding the surface. Make sure I get around the edge real good so when the uh, panel moves, there won't be a ghost line. And 
you can see it absorbs into that cedar much, much faster than it does into the chair. Cedar, some nice wood. I need to just flood the surface. Make sure I don't miss any spots. And if it dries in any place, go back and put some more on that area. Here's the completed blanket chest. This turned out really nice. The cherry really accentuates the Lebanese cedar. This was a fun project and I hope you enjoyed it here at the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop. Enjoy your shop time. If you're interested in any information or plans on any of the items featured on the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop, just check out our website, AppalachianHeritageWoodshop.com. Remember, be proud of your Appalachian heritage.